So I'm just going to jump right in. This is Idiot with a Library Card, and I'm going to be talking about a book today. Now, I have read this book a few times, and every time I read this book, it has a real and different impact on me. The impact it has on me is religious. The book is a religious book. It is the Book of Concord, or Concordia, the Lutheran Confession. Now, if you are unfamiliar, I will explain what this book is and why it's had such an impact on me. And you're going to get a lot of that as I plan on doing a seven-ish episode series on the Book of Concord. If you have never read the Book of Concord, it is basically a collection of documents that lay out the beliefs or confession of the Lutheran Church. These works were written in the 16th century during the Reformation. The works in the book are not all by Martin Luther, but there is a host of writers. The book is pretty dense, and that is one of the things I really like about it. It goes really deep into what Lutherans especially, but I would say Christians in general, believe. There is a really nice diversity of depth with each document, as one of the documents is something older children study to get confirmed in the Lutheran Church, where others go so in-depth, mostly only pastors would be very familiar with the documents. I have a lot to say about each document in this book and why I like it, and why I'm a proud Lutheran, because of this work. Now, I don't want to dive too deep into what these works say, as I have so much to say about each document. And I want to take my time with this, and really dive into all the great reasoning, and the divine inspiration that this book stirs deep in my soul. So I'm going to do some of the key documents in this book, and we'll go into what they are and what they say and why I have such an affinity for them. I will say I have a great version of this book. And like my Lutheran Study Bible, which I believe I've talked about in the past, my Book of Concord is from Concordia Publishing House and is chock full of notes and articles. The book also looks great. I think it's my nicest looking book on my bookshelf. And yeah, sorry, this isn't a library book. Uh, you may be able to find it in the library, but all the documents are, are in the public domain and readily available if you don't feel like buying this book. Now, it being the nicest book on my shelf isn't saying much, as I do have a good collection of books, but am not someone who collects or has a bunch of leather-bound books or, or first editions or nice-looking books. This one is leather feeling. I kind of doubt it's leather, actual real leather bound, but it's just nice and has a nice feel and look to it. It's only about 35 bucks, and I would get it from the Concordia Press if you are going to get it and buy it. If you want to dip your toe in, again, the books are 500 years old. They're all in the public domain. You can get them free in PDF form. Or they're also all recorded on the internet, so you could probably listen to them if that's how you enjoy consuming books. I actually don't think you need to be Lutheran to get a lot out of this book. If you are a Christian, you will get a lot out of it, no matter what denomination. I think it explains a lot of things in simple ways, and also dives in pretty deep with really good advice for and a lot of interesting observations about Scripture and what Scripture says and what Christians believe. And I would say, and I, I think the book really drills this home, is that religion, and especially Christianity, is not something you are. It's something you do. It is a good book to turn to if you are looking for affirmation or guidance. Now, if you are not a Christian, you may still find this stuff interesting, so you don't have to read the book. You can just listen to the next few shows and, and get a good understanding of what the book says. Hopefully, I can provide that service. So I'm really excited about this project. But before I close out, I just want to gush about a few more things this print has that I love. And they connect to Martin Luther. So it has a whole history of the different translations through the years of this book. And I will say, this beginning part of the book is not the most inspiring. I personally love notes from the translators, but this isn't going to give you what I'm going to talk about later on, all the sort of in-depth religious knowledge. But it does a really good job explaining 
how the translations are done. And again, love the notes of translators and really appreciate the work translators do. The care that they put into translating a work like this just amazes me. And again, you will get into other episodes of this series. Translation is very important to the Lutheran Church. As Martin Luther famously translated the Bible into German, so the common people could understand it and exactly what he said. He didn't translate the Latin version. He actually translated the original Hebrew and then the original Greek of the New Testament. And in the notes of the translator, you can feel the seriousness the translators took in delivering both an accurate and understandable translation. Now, it is not like translating scripture, and I just want to make this clear, and the writers and translators and editors of this great work also push and make this clear in the beginning. This book is not scripture. It is not like the Book of Mormon. These works, I would say, are God-inspired, but I wouldn't call them the Word of God. That designation is solely for scripture. It is just these works are very important to me, and I am going to be talking about them in high esteem. But I just want to make it clear, I don't consider it scripture. The Lutheran Church doesn't consider it scripture. It's not an add-on to the Bible. It draws a lot from the Bible and uses the Bible as a reference point to explain our beliefs. Part of being a Lutheran is that we should be, and I know some of the Lutheran churches have kind of strayed from this, but we should be very scripture-based. Like Everything we do in the church and everything that we think should be done in the church needs to be based in scripture. I am very lucky, as I was born and raised in the Lutheran church. Now, I stepped away for a while, and then when I decided to come back to the church, I wanted to look around at different churches, but I, I wanted to go also go back to my Lutheran roots. So I picked up this book, the Book of Concord, and it sold me on Lutheranism. It is a perfect church for me, a church founded by a voracious reader, a prolific writer, and he also hung out at the bar a lot. This book is quite large, but there are also so many other writings by Luther and his theologians. This book contains, I would say, books that really are the founding of the Lutheran Church, but Luther also has so many other writings outside of this book. And again, Luther is just such a great writer and, you know, just was so well well read. It's just a perfect church for me and has such a perfect history and background. Now, what I'm talking about today really is what I call the Roman numeral pages. You know, the Roman numeral pages are are like a pretext to the actual document. When you get into the actual numbered pages, that's considered the actual document. But the Roman numeral pages are are sort of the preamble, sort of like what this book's about, who's the translator, how it was translated, all that cool stuff. There's just a ton of great information in that beginning part about the Reformation and the history of the Reformation and the history of the book itself. Um, I'm going to close with a quote from F. Benty, the guy who basically was charged with this version of the translation. And keep in mind, the Book of Concord is also known and referred to as the Lutheran symbols. So when I say Lutheran symbols, when I read this quote, I'm going to, I'm going to be talking about the Book of Concord, also known as the Lutheran confession or the Lutheran symbols. Whenever the Lutheran church ignored her symbols, or rejected all or some of them. There she always fell an easy prey to her enemies. But wherever she held fast to her God-given crown, esteemed and studied her confessions, and actually made them a norm and a standard of her entire life and practice, there the Lutheran Church flourished and confounded all her enemies. So again, I am super excited to do this project. A few shows on the Book of Concord and her contents. It's going to be really interesting, I think. I would also just recommend, lastly, I'm not working for Concordia Press, but I would also just recommend that it's a great book to own because of all the wonderful artwork 
contained in it. There's a ton of pictures, and and personally, that Renaissance era era, the the 1600s is probably my favorite time for art. Um, I really I really just love the the visual depictions, especially the religious art, which a majority of that art is. I just really love the depictions of of the Bible and what happens. There is a picture and this, this goes to translation. So I'll close with this. There's this great picture. So for some time, the Latin Bible believed, and I guess I'll have to get into the Bible story, but Moses goes up to talk to God. Uh, This is where he gets the 10 commandments. And when he's talking to God, his, he's so close to the essence of God that his, his face basically glows for the rest of his life. But the thing is, there was a mistranslation, and instead of them having his face glow, the Catholic Church and the people who translated that part of the Bible were under the impression that Moses grew horns. So this, there's this great picture, and I can't find it anywhere else on the internet, but I can only find it in this book. Where And if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments story, the first time Moses gets the commandments, he comes down. This is when the Israelites make the golden calf and they're going to worship that and there's this great picture of it's moses he had he's just smashed the tablets and there's this like joyous people sort of doing the maypole dance i believe it's called uh like circling all holding hands around this this little statue of a calf on a high post and you just see behind the bushes this this man with a thick beard and horns has just smashed the ten commandments and it's funny because the Israelites are are the bad guys in that story. Like they've done wrong and Moses is the the righteous one. But in the picture, it looks like Moses is some sort of devil creature that has just smashed the Ten Commandments while the Israelites are just having this joyous time around the calf. And I believe it's a wood carving. That's probably why I can't get a good picture of it on the online. But again, it's just this book is so full of notes. It's so great. And I can't wait to talk about it. So look for more shows about the Book of Concord. I hope that's what you're interested in. If not, maybe if you know some people who haven't listened to my podcast but would be interested in a show about the Lutheran Confessions, let them know about the show. That would really help. Also, what would help is if you like, subscribe, and comment wherever you get your podcast. And again, look for these this series of shows. I'm hoping to to get them out quick. But at the same time, I really want to spend a lot of time researching and getting these shows right and really giving you some solid information on the Book of Concord. So thanks for listening.